I'm not going to present research findings, <coughs> but instead I will address a number of issues uh, that are associated to the implementation of these uh, zero deforestation commitments. And uh, because they represent an emerging trend in the conservation of uh, remaining forests in the world. So the issues that are going to be uh, briefly discussed <coughs> this morning are not supposed to be comprehensive either. Um, they reflect the thinking of the governance portfolio actually at C4, which is investing time and resources now um, in the study of this issue. So this is very much a collective work, and uh, that includes people such as Pablo Pacheco, Sofia Gnitsch, uh, Christopher Bedzinski, George Neveld, our research director, Steve, and uh, myself. <clears throat> so the origins of, of this movement can be linked to um, the relative failure, or at least slow implementation of a number of, of policies and mechanisms and initiatives in the past. You can think about RADD, you can think about FLECT processes, the establishment of protected areas, a number of certificate, certification standards, uh, and others. The origins are also linked to the rise in agricultural, uh, agricultural commodities production as a major cause of deforestation in the tropics. And the origins can also be linked to <clears throat> a very high, or actually an increased intensity of campaigns by NGO against major corporations um, in order to change the practices on the ground. So to make a long story short, as an introduction, I would say that the private sector is now seen as the most effective target to reduce deforestation right away, as companies <clears throat> make these decisions on the ground. And they are easy targets of campaigns um, that affect their image among consumers. And so th this is a very specific uh, uh, characteristic for uh, this movement. And as targeted companies <clears throat> include processors, <clears throat> uh, traders, retailers, consumer good manufacturers, beside producers, of course, they, these commitments are also commonly referred to as um, deforestation-free supply chains because it's all about cleaning these supply chains. So there's been commitments now for a few years. Uh, you may remember Nestle, <coughs> who was, uh, that was one of the first in 2010. Uh, but these commitments have clearly increased in intensity over the past uh, two years. And uh, <coughs> it's, it's important to also mention the New York Declaration on Forests that was signed in September 2014, last year. And uh, it can be seen as more or less a breakthrough uh, with the signatures of, of the major groups, uh, but also governments and um, NGOs and other stakeholders. So according to this declaration, the objective is to cut natural forest loss um, <clears throat> in half by 2020 and to end it by 2030. And since that time, there's been literally an avalanche of commitments. So Indonesia, that I'm going to <clears throat> study today, has been at the forefront of this movement with two sectors primarily involved, oil palm and pulp and paper. These two sectors have been <clears throat> historically, traditionally involved, uh, associated, I would say, to large-scale deforestation um, <clears throat> to give way to the establishment of oil palm plantations or pulpwood plantations to supply the meals. These commitments have multiplied impressively recently, but still a number of issues have to be addressed to make sure that these commitments are sustainable, equitable, and I would say even effective, which is not demonstrated yet. So the scope of these commitments is important, and we observe clearly a tendency to move beyond zero deforestation in order to include peatland management, uh, but also conflicts with local populations. So it would be misleading to think of this commitment, of this movement, as only concerned by the sourcing of crops of fiber from deforestation-free areas. Yet, as this remains actually the core of these commitments, it is also useful to note that zero gross deforestation is usually considered and applied as opposed to zero net or zero illegal uh, deforestation. It means in practice that the compensation of forest conversion somewhere by reforestation elsewhere uh, is usually not permitted as part of these commitments. The question of definitions is of course also central 
Indeed, stopping deforestation implies to define what is a forest, which in turn requires to have the tools to identify these forests for conservation. There is a multitude of potential definitions of forests, depending on your perspectives. Could be biodiversity, could be density of tree cover, and so on and so forth. But for these commitments, two tools have been primarily used to identify what we call no-go areas that won't be converted. These two tools are high conservation value, HCV, and high, high carbon stock, HCS. So with regards um, HCV, it looks at the range of values in terms of biophysical, but also cultural aspects, along with environmental services, and also interactions between ecosystems. High carbon stock, HCS, on the other hand, looks more specifically at biomass, per hectare, and it was more recently designed as part of the commitments uh, and discussions around <coughs> mitigation of climate change. So in that case, the measurement of biomass is used as a proxy for the condition of the forest cover. It is important also to note that these tools are evolving very rapidly. They are modified, they are refined, and the way forward seems to be actually a combination of both in order to be as comprehensive as possible in how you identify forests. So although the movement is, is based on the assumption that the private sector makes commitments for its own sourcing of crops and fiber, um, we see a, greater, a future for greater involvement of the public sector, um, as corporate commitments in practice can hardly stand alone. We observe in Indonesia, unfortunately, that a number of companies have faced resistance by the government in the implementation of their commitments. In particular, problems were identified with all palm concessions, all palm plantations concessions, where the areas, when, when the areas set aside um, based on HCV or HCS assessments were subsequently removed from the concession and reallocated to other companies for further conversion. It can also happen that when the completion of these assessments is too long, that concession licenses are eventually withdrawn and reallocated to other companies as well. So for these reasons, it seems obvious that the movement will have to move to what we call more hybrid forms of governance with the support of government. For instance, in order to solve social conflicts with appropriate law enforcement, and the identification of legitimate versus abusive claims to land. This cooperation between public and private could also translate into more jurisdictional approaches at the district or provincial level, as was attempted by RADD as well. I would also mention initiatives such as a one map in Indonesia that also welcome in order to avoid overlaps between permits issued by different bodies. In terms of issues, smallholders are also identified as key actors for the success of the movement on the ground and its sustainability. Indeed, there are risks that pledgers occupy very large areas of land and that decisions to set aside forested areas while cultivating the rest lead to very restricted access to land by smallholders. In other words, occupation of land by the big groups. This risk is, is intensified <coughs> and, um, in, in Indonesia and for the oil palm sector because of the multitude of land claims associated to uncertain land tenure and because the smallholders actually represent an extraordinary dynamic sector with a great variety of actors with different characteristics. In addition, <coughs> with an increasing share of the private companies committing to zero deforestation, there is a risk that smallholders suffer from restricted access to markets but also to processing units, which is something we label as uh, market fragmentation. Therefore, they have to be involved in a way or another, and the future efforts might have to focus on how to make smallholders eligible to these deforestation-free supply chains. Legacy. Legacy is another key issue, <clears throat> and can be understood as the fact that many committing companies have been involved in environmental destruction and abuse of people's rights in the past. So 
that they might have to go beyond these zero deforestation uh, commitments and, um, in the future. They might have to go beyond simply stopping deforestation and violating the rights of people. So this, in practice, can translate in several ways, including the restitution of land to communities or into additional investments in forest restoration. We can actually already observe a number of efforts made by the main pulp and pepper groups to move to a landscape approach with concrete investments in the system of ecosystem restoration concessions in Indonesia. And this should probably be encouraged. So these are just some prominent issues that C4 is interested in for uh, further examination. We're working here on living material, and this is work in progress. We don't know exactly yet about the, the, the actual outcomes of this movement. So to summarize very briefly, we actually see great potential in the emergence of this movement for concrete, that's important, and sizable action against deforestation in key countries like Indonesia, but it could be also Brazil. But there are also a range of risks, especially with respect to smallholders, and also the necessity to rely on the support by the governments to be truly effective and sustainable. So the way forward, one of the ways forward, might also be a consolidation of standards. There's been a proliferation of commitments and standards. And an united industry, government, and civil society front, as well as a more inclusive mechanism to ensure more growers, growers can participate. And I will stop here. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, uh, Romain, for, for those comments and observations. So we've got some time now for questions and comments from colleagues. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're, ah, Christoph. Maybe I'll start just by asking. Yeah. The, the, the last uh, um, point, that one of the last points you made about possible solutions to the United Front of uh, private sector and the government. Uh, could you maybe just elaborate what, what do you have in mind exactly? What kind of united front, what, what would that be? Is it some kind of fora or uh, what does this involve? What is this united front? So, <clears throat> well, yeah, I think it can take different forms, actually. Um, when I mentioned very briefly the possibility to have, for instance, jurisdictional approaches <clears throat> that would be a way to actually have the private companies, but also the government, or the subnational, actually, uh, authorities, uh, working together in order to define some areas that would be um, <clears throat> free of deforestation. The problem is, what we see now is that you have a multitude, you have a multiplication, actually, of these commitments that go in many different directions by all of these private companies. And even worse, I mean, these companies operate at different levels. They could be producers, but I mean, the innovation is that many of these companies are not producers. They are traders, they are retailers, which is actually a way to include uh, more actors. So the problem is you have different definitions, you have different standards, you have different kinds of commitments with different kinds of starting dates, methodologies to identify forests and everything, so that having something done at the jurisdiction level with the implication of, of the authorities uh, might actually be the way forward and a way to give even more credibility and effectiveness to, um, to the movement in practice. Um, so the government, in order to be involved yeah, in, the, in, in this movement, will have to, uh, to show willingness uh, to participate. And that might depend on the countries, but as we look at Indonesia today, it looks like the problem is you may have uh, conflicting objectives, actually, between um, the government and these companies. The thing is, these commitments actually go beyond the um, legal framework, the regulations. This is a point. And uh, so there are potential conflicts between the laws and the objectives of the government in terms of development and the strategies 
by the company in order to save the reputation, in order to respond to these campaigns. So in order to deal with that and to solve the, these potential conflicts, I think that all of these actors have to actually sit together and uh, work out solutions together. And that might be done at the jurisdictional level. It's a possibility. Okay. Yeah. Other comments and questions? Fanta? You, you, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I wonder, you said that the experience in Indonesia could be replicated in Brazil, but I understand Brazil. I, I, I okay, misunderstood. I will clarify. Oh, <laughs> and I wonder because Brazil didn't sign the declaration in New York. And also, I would like to know mm. what do you think about Brazil's mm. position not to sign mm. the declaration? Okay. Yeah. So maybe that, uh, I mean, I would like to involve, I mean, some, some people in the audience as well. And, and Pablo, for instance, if you want to comment on that, because you are the one who knows uh, uh, most about the situation in Brazil. But in terms of replication, no, it's not what I mean. It's actually interesting to see major actually differences between countries um, in terms of what is done as part of the zero deforestation movement. When we look at Brazil, I mean, we see something that is more um, in line with the regulations. Uh, actually, I mean, there's been a, a number of articles written about these commitments in the beef industry. And it looks like these commitments, uh, labeled zero deforestation commitments, were in response by uh, some action by the government, the federal government, or even states, in order, to, in order for these companies to comply with the regulations, and especially the environmental uh, cadaster. Uh, so in Indonesia, it's completely different <coughs> because the government is actually kind of um, unwilling to step into this process, as I understand, because there might be these conflicting objectives. So it was, it's interesting to see, I mean, <clears throat> it's very, we are very early in the process and it's difficult to draw you know, lessons and conclusions, but it looks like something that looks very simple on paper, the very rational of the zero deforestation movement and commitments can be applied in very contrasting ways uh, depending on, on the countries where it takes place. So I would not personally draw lessons from what happens in Indonesia for replication in other countries. That's what I could respond. Other questions? Dan? Um, from my understanding, there are various NGOs working with the companies. Uh, there are other uh, international organizations like ourselves who are also looking at zero deforestation. This is a relatively new thing. Who, in, you know, amongst all these players, is sort of emerging as sort of a leader in, the, in this field? Uh, C4? <laughs> no, um, I wouldn't say it's very difficult to, to say, and I have a very distorted view, I would say, and even maybe biased. But I think as far as Indonesia is concerned, I think it's important to look at um, Greenpeace, for instance, and uh, the Forest Trust. These are two different kinds of, um, of actors. So Greenpeace is this uh, <coughs> NGO that everybody knows about. TFT, the Forest Trust, is more like a consulting or auditing firm. And so they play different roles. And they've been very influential, actually, in, in how some of these oil palm companies have <coughs> defined their own commitments, and especially how they have defined the tools that are going to uh, enable them to identify the forests to, to be set aside, which is actually the point. So if you have different kinds of methodologies, um, you, may have, you may end up with um, different kinds of forests uh, set aside, and so different outcomes from an environmental perspective. So I mean, and so, so I, I see Greenpeace and, and, and TFT in Indonesia, but in other countries it might be completely different. Um, in terms of research centers, um, actually what you see is a proliferation of, um, of initiatives with, with websites and everything that are supposed to uh, keep track of all of, the, all of these commitments. Yeah? 
in order to keep track of the scope, to keep track of the implementation. So it seems to be a very competitive environment. And um, I personally don't see one main and prominent actor. It, it's more like a, yeah, proliferation. It's like a proliferation of, st of standards in order to reflect the views of all of these stakeholders and before you, you agree on one you know, good standard. It's kind of the same with all of these websites and organizations that try to keep track and monitor the, implementations, the implementation of these, of these commitments. Who knows in the future who is going to be seen as a reference? Okay. Yeah. yeah you Can want I just a follow-up question, Dan? Yeah. yeah, follow up. yeah. Uh, would the private sector, the companies that are working in this space that have that have pledged zero net deforestation, would they welcome one standard? Well, uh, I'm not in the heads. Um, I think that so far they they might feel comfortable with their own standards for obvious reasons, and when you, I mean, it's, it's kind of an open field. So you can make, you know, all of these statements about your policies to avoid deforestation, to solve conflicts with people. And if you're able to, at the same time, uh, define the games of the rule, then it's even better, right? You will play with your own rules. And so the implications of having one standard is actually that you don't decide of the games of the rule anymore. So I don't think that is, it is really in the interest of these companies to, to have one standard. But at the same time, I mean, this is very new. There is going to be more and more scrutiny by a number of actors, including ourselves. And so maybe that in the end, I mean, these companies will have no other choice than agreeing on, on one standard that will give more credibility. As well as I said before that, you know, working with the governments might give more credibility to all of these commitments. Having one standard might be the same. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's a jungle. And it's, it's, it's also a jungle because many of these statements and, and policies are announced but have not started yet. You know, like the starting date might be in 2016 or 2020. And especially in the oil palm sector, because it, it, that's really a jungle because you have so many groups, so many companies, you have smallholders and everything. In the pulp and paper sector, it's kind of different. You have an oligopoly with two main groups, and they have actually already established their policies with different names, sustainable forest management for, for April and forest conservation policy for, for APP. And that started already in early 2013. And they have actually already been evaluated, assessed by independent assessors. In one case, Rainforest Alliance. In the other case, uh, KPMG as, a, as an auditing firm. So. In that case, I mean, for pulp and paper, it's less of a jungle. It's, 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 re it's really easier. But at the same time, they don't want to have their common policy. They don't, want, they don't want to have their common standards because it's kind of a race. You know, you want to, it's a race in terms of communication as well. Um, so, but I don't see, I don't know about the future. Maybe they won't have a choice. Can we take one more question? Pablo. Uh, Romain, you mentioned something, but uh, I would like to ask you about if you can elaborate a bit more about the indirect effects of these commitments that can be indirect. Well, the direct effect seems to be obvious, but the indirect seems to be less obvious, like, for example, leakage effects, uh, segmentations of value change, yeah. changes in the capacity to compete of these different groups. So if, if right. you can elaborate a bit more on that. So, well, you named it. So. <clears throat> Leakage, for instance. Um, so, so to make it clear, uh, I think once again, because I think it's important to understand that, that potential loophole in this, in this movement, it's about supply chains and it's about all of these individual companies and everything. So that leakage is actually an obvious risk. Uh, you have a number of companies that commit they make sure that they source their fiber or their crops from deforestation-free areas, but it might actually, you know, um, um, displace or it, it might displace a problem to other areas. So that's kind of obvious, but that's something that is quite similar with, uh, I would say, with RADD, but at, different, at a different level. If you, if you assume that RADD is, is applied at a country level, you might have leakage with displacement of activity in other countries. In the case of zero deforestation commitments, you may have leakage and displacement of activities just to other areas. 
And that's something that was illustrated by um, the examples of these um, old palm uh, plantations that undertaken these assessments and decided to set aside a number of areas. But then the licenses were, were withdrawn, withdrawn, or the set aside areas were just you know, withdrawn from these concessions, removed from these concessions, and relocated. So that's so leakage is uh, is an obvious problem. At the same time, um, so if you look at pulp and paper, I mean, as almost all of the sector is involved, is included, and actually has committed, leakage is, is less of a problem uh, because they just control the entire estate. In the case of old palm, it's, it's more worrying. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a more tangible threat, indeed. Um, but that's the point of having actually commitments at the level of traders. I think that you have about, uh, if I remember well, like um, in Indonesia, 96 or, I mean, almost all of global trade of palm oil production in Indonesia is covered by these commitments. So actually, what is not covered is just production for domestic uh, consumption, uh, for domestic markets. And this might represent about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the production. So indeed, there is a risk of leakage for that. In terms of indirect impacts, you mentioned also indeed the question of smallholders. Um, so we see, we see, well, there are several problems. There are problems associated to uh, land claims, right? I am not sure, though, that this would be specific to these commitments. Uh, you have. You know, the problem of tenure in Indonesia is extremely um, uh, prominent, and uh, you have it with the expansion of uh, productive activities, with the expansion of, of plantations. So I'm not sure that this is made even more problematic with these commitments. But the problem is that if you control these large areas, large concessions, and you set aside, let's say, 30, 40, even 50 percent of the land sometimes, as as, as is the case for some of these uh, pulp wood plantations. Then you have to produce in other areas, right, in order to supply your meals. You have your capacities, you just decide to not use the full potential of your land, of your concession, so you have to produce from elsewhere. It can actually be a risk, but it can also be an opportunity, depending on the sectors. In the case of old palm, I guess it would be a risk, because then you have to apply uh, to other land, to get permits, and to dis develop your plantations, and, and then you, you, you end up with increased pressure um, uh, towards, towards uh, smallholders uh, that who have a restricted access to land. In the case of the pulp and paper sector, I would almost actually see that as an opportunity, because you already have the um, systems in place, you already have the um, regulations in place for smallholders, to get access to the forest estate in order to establish their own plantations. So that in the end, if the main groups uh, want to increase the capacities, processing capacities, and need to access to you know, other sources of fiber, they might have to rely actually on these smallholders that might benefit from support from the government, uh, at least in terms of uh, rights, uh, new rights to the land, uh, usually use rights for 35 years, or even incentives sometimes. So it's not actually very clear in terms of indirect impacts whether these are going to be purely negative, but also, or also represent sometimes uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very early and uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to conclude on that. Yeah. So there's so much interest in what you're speaking to, Romain, that we're going to take at least two more questions, Pembika and then Peter. Um, I just had a very simple question. So what, what are the incentives for the companies that comply? So the incentive is uh, not to be blacklisted. I will give a very short answer. No, I mean, it's, um, I mean, that's the point, right, of having these NGO campaigns. I mean, you can remember KitKat campaigns, very visible. You can remember that even Barbie was dumped by Ken, you know, because the producer Mattel was accused of uh, you know, using natural forests to produce packaging products. 
Um, so they're really everywhere. You can see these campaigns on television. You can see these campaigns on many, many, many media. And so they have to, re they have to react in some ways. Otherwise, they might have reduced access to actually the markets. You as a consumer, me as a consumer, might decide to go for different products. I would say it's kind of a um, theoretical risk. Yeah? Uh, I'm not so sure myself, I'm not so sure that studies have been made that actually demonstrate the impacts on consumers of having these campaigns. But at least what we can see is that the companies take it seriously enough to take action. And this seems to be a, a massive trend. This is to be a, a very heavy trend. So at least the companies make the assumption that they will lose market shares, more or less, if they don't react to these campaigns. Isn't it more concrete than, isn't it just, just a comment, isn't it a bit yeah. more concrete than that? And that many of the major consumer goods companies uh, insist that the, the products that they buy have been uh, produced sustainably and against certain standards. If you don't meet those standards, you can't sell on those markets. You can't sell to those companies. And we can come to Brazil at some point and talk about the soy moratorium where companies in, uh, pledged in 2005 as a condition for getting access to European and American markets that their production of soy would not contribute to any additional deforestation. And research undertaken last year, nine years later, uh, established that there was only a 1% increase in deforestation on land covered by the soy moratorium compared to a 35% increase in deforestation in areas where soy was produced under the supervision of the Brazil Forest Code. So it's that the market is imposing, it's just not reputational sort of campaigns, it's very specific requirements established by consuming companies. Home Depot in the U.S. will not mm. purchase any timber that hasn't been produced FSC certification. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government, what, what we call increasingly in, in governance portfolio, uh, these are non-state forest governance arrangements. And they're really about the interaction between civil society, companies, and markets. I'm sorry to intervene at, at such length, but Peter. Thanks, uh, thanks Roman. This is a really interesting new big topic for, for us and for many others. Um, and I have a number of uh, concerns, just like you have, and, and just wanted to point to a few of them. One is actually coming out also of what Steve just said. What we're seeing is a tremendous new trend that, at least in some of the rich markets, goods should be sustainably sourced. That's good. And that's what's behind the New York Declaration, uh, etc., etc. Everybody was holding hand and thinking this was a good idea. Problem is that sustainably sourced has been equaled to no deforestation, which means that as long as there is no deforestation, everything else is okay. That, that is a clear danger that we're approaching that, that kind of situation. Um, and, and so one concern I think you're addressing is that the concept of zero deforestation is monopolizing the sustainability agenda in terms of land mm -hmm. use, forestry, landscapes, and so on. That, that's a big yeah. concern. The second concern I have is that we're talking about zero deforestation oil palm, for example. Does anyone know how much deforestation is caused by conversion to oil palm plantations today? I haven't seen any number of that, so I don't know what we're chasing. And considering that deforestation is going down quite rapidly in most places, I think even in Indonesia, um, I would, of course, have known those things had I been a CEO signing the New York Declaration that this is not a big deal. I mean, we can, we can achieve zero deforestation and still get our products out there. So, so uh, you know, are we chasing a white elephant here? Uh, so on the first, um, <clears throat> actually, yeah, I mean, this is a criticism that was, I think, before addressed to RODD as well, you know, kind of a focus on, on, on deforestation, conservation, and leaving aside all of these peatlands and leaving aside Cerrado in Brazil and uh, all of these other ecosystems. That was important. Okay, so I will, yeah, yeah. You're right, but I will go back to that. Um, and so, so that's a problem, and that's actually, as I understand, but Pablo might, might confirm or, in, or infirm, that's why Brazil was not signatory, actually, to the New York Declaration last year, because they didn't want their development agenda to be preempted by these zero deforestation commitments. Huh? They thought 
it's wiser actually to be able to do land use planning for development at the national level and then you know still keep uh, the options to convert some pieces of forest into something else because indeed so I think maybe that's more or less your concern but and then on the social side on the peatland management side I would actually emphasize that these commitments actually go beyond uh, purely a pure conservation and they have to deal with um, with social conflicts and, and, and as part of many of these commitments companies have to undertake to apply the free and prior informed consent uh, methods in order to make sure that, that, that people who live in the areas are aware of the development and agree uh, to the objectives. So, and you also have these policies labeled no deforestation, no peat, no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation. And that, in that case, that involves labor rights and everything. So I wouldn't say really that uh, these commitments are just about conservation. Yeah? They might go beyond. And they might go beyond even more in the future because of the pressures by the NGOs. We had these forest dialogue, uh, the first dialogue recently in Riau, and a um, range of stakeholders, many, about 30 of them, NGOs, firms, and everything. And social issues were really at the center, I would say, of these discussions, sometimes even more than the deforestation. Uh, your second point was... Yes, yeah, so no, I'm not sure that this is a ghost huh, that we're, sh we're chasing or a white elephant. Um, no, I think that old palm is, as I understand, yeah, there's been studies about the development of old palm in Indonesia, and clearly it is a threat, as I understand. Yeah, I don't have the figures, maybe Christoph has, but I think it's a, it's a real threat that is worth being addressed. And then you have the question of companies. Yeah. Sorry, I have to yeah. clarify my question okay. then, because yeah. obviously expansion of oil pan has been on for, in forest land. But looking forward, ah, is, okay. is anyone looking at this? How much, is it, how much are we talking about? Yeah, okay. You don't have the figures. Who has the figures? No, no, I don't have figures. But what we see uh, as part of our project, when interacting with, um, with local governments, as a district or provincial levels, and the companies, I mean, a lot, I mean, actually most of of the licenses, if not all of the licenses for agricultural development on, on, on the first estate are for OPA. And we have this project in East Kalimantan with this uh, Mahakam Ulu district where you have like maybe 95% of forest cover. And all of the new licenses for agricultural development, right, are allocated to OPA companies. And so, and, and people don't even ask a question. It's kind of obvious. There is um, some sort of craziness about it. And I think it's not going to stop. This is really maybe the, the major sector to address uh, as long as deforestation is, is concerned. Pulp and paper, maybe we don't have time now to elaborate, but pulp and paper is, in, it, it's also understand just very briefly, yeah? Because I say that the two prominent sectors were oil palm and, and, and uh, pulp and paper in Indonesia. They are completely different. They pose completely different challenges that can be addressed in different ways. Oil palm is actually, I would say, the major threat now. Pulp and paper has really tried to engage in a change of the practices, and the current capacities can actually be supplied more or less by existing plantations. So that the threat to natural forests is kind of limited with current conditions. And they also have more flexibility in terms of um, how they apply these commitments because they are subject to these forestry laws which is not the case of the oil palm sector, uh, which is subject to different kinds of laws, which explains why the government, <coughs> there is this Neglected Lands Act uh, that was issued in 2010. And that's actually the legal basis for the government to remove part of these concessions that are set aside in oil palm concessions. Eh? That doesn't exist for pulp wood plantations. They have a requirement to develop up to 70% of the concessions for, for the plantations. And in many cases, they develop only 40, 50% of the concession. And nobody, no questions asked. Uh, nobody complains at the government level about that. And not, another reason why it happens is that, contrary to what many people think, there is a lack of investment in the pulp and paper sector in Indonesia, especially in, in, in the timber plantations. And the government is actually struggling to have its own uh, development objectives 
uh, being achieved. Um, you have about 10 million hectares of uh, industrial timber plantation concessions in Indonesia and maybe 3 million hectares developed. And the government is just unable to change that. And so they are actually craving for investments. And so they have to be more flexible in how these companies operate and uh, apply the zero deforestation commitments, which is not the case for all palm. All palm is just, you know, anybody want, wants to invest in, maybe you want to invest in all palm, Steve. <laughs> okay, well, let's thank uh, Romain for this very interesting discussion. Thank you.